What do you think, buddy? Oh. Do you want to say hi? What do you think? <laughs> it's been a while. Um, I'm in a new office space, as you guys can see. Um, I moved. So moving forward, this is going to be what you guys are going to be seeing this background. I have a few more things to put up, but yeah, this is going to be the new background moving forward. I hope you guys will enjoy it. Feel free to leave any recommendations down below if you have any ideas. Of course, as always, I do have a Twitter and an Instagram that are linked in the description if you want to follow those. If you do like today's video, give it a like for me. It really does help me out in the algorithm. Um, subscribe if you haven't already and yeah I think that's all I have there I am really looking forward to a great year of content creation and really giving you guys my best effort in these videos so I hope you will cheer me on and I hope you will enjoy the content today we are covering the most highly requested most infamous and arguably the worst tornado in American history a title that's not easily gained in a country that is notorious for its violent twisters. The Tri-State Tornado isn't simply just the deadliest tornado to have ever touched the United States. Its shocking violence and unprecedented path have cemented it in American history as now what almost seems like legend. As many of you know, the Tri-State Tornado was ultimately part of a larger outbreak that consisted of multiple F3 and F4 twisters, but because the Tri-State Tornado itself was so impactful, we're only going to be focusing on the one singular tornado today. On a more serious note, the discussions surrounding today's video are going to be more heavy in nature. There are inevitably going to be some parts that are going to be harder to hear and discuss. So I do encourage you to take that into consideration today if that's something you're not interested in hearing. The Roaring Twenties in the United States was a time of major change socially and economically. World War I has ended a decade prior, and the country, for a time, is in a period of rapid growth and prosperity. As for weather, it's interesting. In 1925, weather forecasting isn't new by any means. Significant meteorological progression had already been happening in the 18th and 19th centuries. But what is new, however, is the study of tornadoes. By the late 1800s, the US Army Signal Corps had been noting the frequency of tornadoes in specific areas and wanted to put efforts into studying surface conditions that appeared to favor those tornado occurrences. So in 1882, Army Signal Corps Sergeant John P. Finley was tasked with investigating tornadoes and how to forecast them and for a short time was incredibly successful, even going on to establish 15 rules for early tornado forecasting. Unfortunately, this major progression would come to an abrupt halt when the Army Signal Corps decided to ban the use of the word tornado from being used in any network or forecast to the public. The concern was that the study of tornadoes was both unreliable and using the word tornado to the general public was only going to cause mass panic. So with the ban of the word tornado, Sergeant P. Finley's efforts were quickly dropped. Regular forecasting would still be carried out by the local weather bureau offices, but tornadoes were off limits. So it's during this period in time in the early 20th century that tornadoes were still very much a taboo subject, shrouded in mystery and myth, and not something the average person gave much thought to. So this is the setting of weather forecasting and the study of tornadoes in the early 20th century. To understand how the Tri-State Tornado came to fruition from a meteorological perspective, we're going to be taking a look at a meteorological reanalysis done and published in 2013. We're not going to go too in-depth on the meteorology today, simply because there is so much information to get through. So if you're interested in a really in-depth meteorological breakdown, of course I'll have some links below that you can go through yourself if you're interested.
March 13, 1925. An offshoot from a cyclone is in the northeastern Pacific, making its way towards the United States. By the next day, this low pressure system, or a synoptic cyclone as it's often called, is centered over northwestern Montana. At this point, the local weather bureau offices are recognizing it as a depression over northern Montana. It's now just 24 hours before the tri-state tornado and outbreak, and the cyclone is seeded over northern Oklahoma. Now, a dry line and cold front are extending southwestward from the low, and a warm front extends eastward. Because it's springtime, moisture is rapidly pluming from the Gulf of Mexico into the southeastern states, with moisture and instability rising out ahead of the low pressure system. The elements are now becoming present for a tornado outbreak to take place. And what's interesting at this point in time, contrary to what you might believe, is that this low pressure system and the entire setup wasn't raising any sort of alarms for any of the forecasters. This system was neither particularly strong nor particularly interesting. The most important thing to remember here, however, is that although now we know that these elements coming together means that a tornado outbreak is likely and imminent, the forecasters at the time in 1925 and the general public have no idea. The Weather Bureau offices are tracking the surface low as it moves through the Midwest. The actual forecast for March 18th, 1925 to the general public called for rain showers and strong, shifty winds. Storms at this point in the early morning hours have already been brewing over Kansas, a sign of not only how volatile the atmosphere was early in the morning, but a really ominous sign of what was to come for the rest of the day. The atmosphere is increasingly ripe for tornadoes. By noon in the tri-state area, strong storms had already begun to form in the open warm sector. It's at this point in Missouri, just around noon, where multiple people recall seeing the sky turn an eerie shade of green and black. They weren't aware at the time, but it's in this increasingly violent atmosphere that the infamous tri-state tornado is beginning to take shape over Missouri. The supercell is moving east-northeast, and notably at an incredibly fast pace. Essentially, this storm was out in the open warm sector and virtually unimpeded. And finally, just after 12.30 p.m., the infamous tri-state tornado touches down. Just a few minutes before 1 p.m. local time, the residents of Ellington, Missouri are going about their day. Dark clouds loom in the distance over Ellington, growing closer very quickly. Shortly after, the first official spotting of the tri-state tornado is reported. At 1.01 p.m., trees began to snap on the northern edge of Ellington. And while the twister didn't move over the major areas of Ellington, rather staying just to the north, it would be here that the tri-state tornado claims its first of hundreds of victims. A farmer on the outskirts of Ellington, Missouri was caught off guard because the unsuspecting storm was moving so quickly. The man and his farm were overtaken before he had time to get out of the way. This was the start of three and a half hours of death and destruction. The tri-state tornado is just beginning. After claiming its first victim and moving over Ellington, Missouri, the twister, now growing in size and intensity, moves towards a small mining town known as Ladana. It's also here that the twister is already reported as having been a double tornado, which is not only a testament to its size, it's also supporting of the theory that this could have been a multiple vortices tornado, which is something that we are going to talk about multiple times throughout its life. 
from interviews of those who lived in Ladana and the town of Annapolis after the tornado, they estimated to have had between two to three minutes from the time they initially saw the clouds coming towards them to the time that the tornado actually struck. In just two minutes, the people of Ladana and Annapolis would have their lives changed forever. Two more lives were taken in the small town of Annapolis, along with 75 people injured. Some $500,000 of damage also occurred in the small town. An estimated 90% of the entire town of Annapolis was damaged. The Twister is now moving on to the more rural portions of Madison and Bollinger counties in Missouri, and unfortunately it's here that not only many farms and smaller businesses would take hits, it's also here that the first schools of many that we're going to discuss today are going to take heavy damage. 32 children would be injured in the rural schools of Bollinger County. And really tragically, this is a theme that we're going to be revisiting a lot of times in today's story. The storm is now in Perry County, Missouri, and things are only about to get worse from here. So it's now 2 p.m. and the Twister is quickly approaching a town called Biel, Missouri. It is said at this point in the Twister's life that it's joined by a satellite vortex tornado. After having traveled parallel with this secondary satellite Twister for some miles, again, this is one of the more mysterious natures of the Tri-State Tornado because there were no pictures of it. The Twister moves into the small town of Biel, and Biel is small enough and the Twister is large enough at this point that it completely engulfs the town. Four people lost their lives in this small village. The Twister destroys all of the homes and businesses in Biel with no building left unscathed. Unfortunately, it's at this point after hitting Biel and quickly approaching the Mississippi River that the fatalities and injuries are only going to get exponentially higher from this point onward. Just to give some perspective as to where we are so far, the Great Tri-State Tornado has traveled some 85 miles through the southern portion of Missouri, taking 13 lives with it, and is now about to cross the Mississippi River onto its second state of Illinois. The Twister has just crossed the Mississippi River and into the state of Illinois. It's 2.26 p.m. and the town of Gorham, Illinois is now being hit with golf ball sized hail. One of the only few signs of impending doom that one would have before the tornado actually struck. Being at 2.30 p.m., it would be in the middle of this workday in a railroad town that the tri-state tornado would strike. By the time anyone realizes what's coming, the twister has already engulfed the entire town. The tornado would enter Gorham's rail yard, where it would throw several boxcars, not only destroying the rail yard itself, but demolishing the several buildings that were surrounding the rail yard in the center of town. Parts of the railroad itself had even been plucked from the ground. Judith Cox was one of the very lucky survivors in downtown Gorham. She had been having lunch in town when the tornado struck. Although she had at some point realized that what was happening was in fact a tornado about to strike the restaurant, it was far too late for her to do anything. Judith was found in the rubble of what used to be a restaurant along with a cow that had survived being blown into the downtown area as well. The chef of the restaurant lost his life. Judith was incredibly fortunate to have survived in the downtown area where many others in Gorham weren't so lucky. The grade school and high school in Gorham both took direct hits from the tri-state tornado. I'm not going to go into detail on the school fatalities here. It's much too disturbing to put in a video. I think you can sort of 
understand why I might want to exclude some of the more intensely graphic parts. However, there were several school fatalities and in total 37 people lost their lives in the town of Gorham. Seven of the fatalities were children in the schools. Some 170 were injured, which of course is a pretty large number for a town of only 500. And unfortunately, Gorham, like many other towns hit by the tri-state tornado, would never fully recover. It's now just after 2.30 p.m. and the town of Gorham has just been completely destroyed. Now, as the twister moves from Gorham towards Murfreesboro with no distinct visible funnel and now at three quarters of a mile in width, nobody can really see this coming or how devastating it's going to be. And there's no way that anybody can move out of the way in time. In the next 40 minutes alone, some 540 people would lose their life in the tri-state tornado. In 1925, Murfreesboro was a rapidly expanding city due to the booming railroad business with a population between 12 and 15,000 residents at the time, which makes it by far the most populated city that the tri-state tornado would directly hit. As the twister approaches Dewey and Clay Streets in Murfreesboro, it's already laying waste to trees and many of the homes in the area, which were largely comprised of wood. Homes on the next few streets, particularly 20th and Walnut Street, were completely removed from their foundations. It was also here where the Miller family, which was a family of six, all lost their lives together in their home, both parents and their four children who were aged one, three, five, and nine years old. The next area to take a direct hit from the Tri-State Tornado was the Mobile and Ohio Railroad Shop. And unfortunately, it was here where 35 of those men would be crushed by equipment as the tornado passed through. Across the street from this rail yard was the Longfellow Grade School. The walls of the Longfellow Grade School collapsed inward not only trapping hundreds of children that were attending the school at the time, but taking 17 children's lives. It was said that the moment the rail yard workers who survived the event were able to come out of the rubble, they immediately ran to the school across the street and dug hand down to the bone to try to rescue the children who lived through the event. And keep in mind at this point in Murfreesboro, there are many fatalities happening. Unfortunately, I'm not able to go over every single one, but mind you, there are a lot of people who are losing their life in Murfreesboro. The tornado is three quarters of a mile wide at this point. Now moving on to 15th and Logan Streets, yet another school would take a direct hit from the storm. Across the street from the Logan School was the First Baptist Church, which at the time was holding a funeral service when the tornado struck. Fortunately, everyone that was at the funeral service was able to move to the basement and survive the storm. But when they came out when the storm was over, they quickly realized that the school, the Logan School across the street, had taken a direct hit as well. Nine more children lost their lives in the Logan School across the street. In total, 154 blocks were completely destroyed in Murfreesboro. Hundreds have just lost their lives. Hundreds more have been horrifically maimed and injured by the twister. Yet the danger still wasn't over for those in Murfreesboro. One of the most tragic parts about the twister in Murfreesboro specifically wasn't just the tornado itself. After the twister had already completely devastated the town, the remaining winds from the tail end of the storm knocked over a single coal burning stove. 
the toppling coals would ultimately catch fire and a major blaze started within the rubble and debris of the freshly destroyed town. 18 people who initially survived the tri-state tornado lost their lives at the Blue Front Hotel after being trapped in the basement. By the time the fires were extinguished in Murfreesboro, over 600 people were severely injured and Murfreesboro was wrecked. Two hundred and thirty-four people have just lost their lives, which was and remains a record for fatalities in a single community from one tornado. And it's really hard to fathom just how powerful this twister must have been for it to not only cause ground scouring, but a massive horrific swath through the entirety of Murfreesboro, but also the fact that it's been continuously causing damage like this for more than two hours at this point. It's almost unreal to think about the amount of death and destruction that came from this singular twister non-stop. And it still wasn't done. The tri-state tornado is now approaching yet another largely populated region called DeSoto. The people of DeSoto who survived the event described seeing a greenish black funnel quickly approach the town. Those who worked at the Alban State Bank in the downtown DeSoto Square were lucky. Not only did they recognize the tornado in time, but they were able to safely shelter in the bank's vault. Dozens other in the downtown DeSoto area weren't so lucky. 36 people lost their lives in less than two minutes in that small corner of DeSoto alone. And not only had the downtown center been in the direct path of the tri-state tornado's fury, the walls of the DeSoto school were very quickly knocked down, and unfortunately there was just no place for everyone to go that was safe inside of the school. In total, 33 children at the DeSoto school lost their lives, most of which were boys who had all been lined up against one singular wall that happened to collapse on them. Horrifically, four children at the time were outside during the tornado and all lost their lives as well. Again, I'm not going to go too in depth on some of the fatalities here, particularly at the school because they are quite gruesome in nature. I don't think it adds any benefit. In total, 69 people were confirmed to have lost their lives in DeSoto. The city of DeSoto itself only sustained about 30% damage to the building structurally. However, it's very evident that the areas that the twister did hit were more populated, uh, particularly the downtown portion and of course the school as well where most of the fatalities occurred. Just a few miles northeast of the town of DeSoto lied the areas of West Frankfurt, Illinois, which sustained about 20% damage. West Frankfurt was a major mining hub. Many of the homes and buildings that were there at the time were fairly new and well built. When the tornado struck, one of the first areas that it actually hit was the Orient Mine itself. And while thankfully the miners were underground safe as the twister passed, this meant that all of the miners' wives and children were in their homes and directly exposed to the tri-state tornado. In total, 127 people lost their lives, most of which were women and children. 22 more people lost their lives in Parrish, Illinois, which was a town so small that not a single building in the town was left untouched. After crossing through the final rural portions of White County in Illinois, the Twister crosses the Wabash River and into its third and final state of Indiana. As the storm approached, farm homes were swept clean. Two children who had been on the bus and were now walking home would be caught up in the storm and lost their lives on the road. Stores, local businesses, the only gas station in the town, schools and homes were all completely swept away in Griffin. And in total, Griffin lost 25 residents with some 250 injured. And after all of this seemingly unfathomable damage, town after town after town that's been hit, the Tri-State Tornado is approaching its final major area, 
Princeton, Indiana. Just after 4.15 p.m. and after having raked over Griffin, tiny pieces of paper and debris are slowly beginning to fall over the town of Princeton, Indiana. It's the remains of Griffin. Within just 10 minutes, the storm tears through Princeton, Indiana. More than a dozen homes are raised to their foundation and 45 more people have lost their lives in Princeton, Indiana. And finally, at 4.30 p.m., after more than three hours of horrific damage, death, and complete destruction, the infamous tri-state tornado takes its final breath of life and dissipates 10 miles northeast of Princeton, Indiana. In just one short afternoon, more than 650 people are now gone and thousands have just had their lives changed forever. In total, 13 counties are hit in some three and a half hours. $16.5 million of damage has been done, two thirds of which occurred in Murfreesboro alone. The best estimation is that 15,000 homes were destroyed. It's impossible for me to ever adequately be able to convey the amount of chaos and fear and confusion that must have surrounded many of these towns just after the tri-state tornado. Not only are many of the towns completely destroyed, you have people who are now lifeless, you have people who are trapped in buildings, you have Murfreesboro, which is on fire. So you can really imagine what this scene must have been like in so many of these towns across three states. In terms of devastation and death, Murfreesboro, of course, was the most devastated by far, with hundreds of fatalities, hundreds more injuries. But for the rural communities, however, one of the scariest problems for a lot of people and one of the reasons why the fatality counts would end up being higher was the amount of people who needed immediate surgery that obviously weren't going to be able to get it right away. 463 people from Murfreesboro alone were injured enough to need immediate surgery. A lot of these people were getting amputations in the coming days, even after the supply of anesthesia ran out. Overnight, Murfreesboro presented a tragic scene. Half of the city that's been struck, many of which now are homeless, are huddling around campfires together, trying to stay warm and manage to cook a meal. By the next morning, several newspapers had started to run stories about what was being called the Great Tri-State Tornado. And amidst all the mass chaos and confusion, many of the newspapers are reporting fatalities in the thousands. And while I do think it was irresponsible to have written those articles without confirmation, claiming thousands of people had lost their lives, this was one of the reasons why aid was able to come in so quickly because these stories were being published across the nation and people wanted to help in any way that they could. So in a lot of ways, it was actually a good thing. So of course you can imagine the coming days were filled with not only the search and rescue process, people trying to get bodies out of rubble, taking care of the injured, and starting food lines for those who have just lost everything in the storm. 
Shortly after, the Illinois governor dispatched a message of coming emergency assistance and funds for the people. The American Red Cross in St. Louis sent volunteers to come in and act for the agency for the receipt and disbursement of emergency relief funds for all of the communities involved. We're going to talk a little bit more in depth about the fatalities and injuries, not for any sort of polarizing effect, but rather to just give a little bit more context as to what that entails and also what the lasting implications of those fatalities were. The official fatality count by the National Weather Service remains 695 for the entirety of the tri-state tornado alone. So as you can imagine, when we're talking about a fatality count, that is as high as the tri-state tornado. We're also talking about mass burials and mass funerals. Uh, we're talking about a large number of bodies that have to be dealt with. A lot of these cemeteries in smaller towns were actually hit as well. So in some cases, the towns had to quickly rebuild their cemeteries just so that they could accommodate all of the bodies that they were having to now take on. One of the saddest parts about this entire process, in my opinion, is the fact that because there were so many people who had to have funeral processions, most people were only allotted a five minute funeral before they had to go on to the next funeral and burial. I've talked about a lot of anomalous events on this channel. I've talked about events as deadly and devastating as Joplin. And I've talked about the 2011 outbreak, but this is almost unreal. It's so much death and so much devastation that it, it really doesn't feel real to talk about destruction on this scale. And I think that's why I'm attempting to spend so much time talking about it is because I want to give it a more human feel rather than just throwing out the number 695 at you, because I think in a lot of ways, just saying simply 695 fatalities doesn't really encapsulate the real human feel to that. In the year 1925, when the word tornado itself is banned, of course there is no official system for surveying or rating tornadoes like we have today. However, because this event was so incredibly anomalous and so devastating, the Weather Bureau offices, of course, at the time recognized that and decided to take a survey of this storm on foot. This survey took a total of seven days where the meteorologist walked the exact path of the twister in its full entirety. The twister in its entirety was found to have tracked 219 miles from start to finish with an average width of three quarters of a mile and up to a mile in width at certain points as well. Meaning that the tri-state tornado is recorded as and noted as the longest twister path in American history by far, really. As we had mentioned, the average forward speed of the tri-state tornado was around 62 miles per hour. However, it got up to 73 miles per hour forward speed between Gorham and Murfreesboro. Now, if you look up the twister now, of course, it has an F5 rating. And you might be wondering, well, if the Fujita scale didn't exist at the time, how does it have an F5 rating? And that is simply because Dr. Ted Fujita and Thomas Grizzulis would eventually go back and rate the twister based on damage photos and different information that they had access to. It's never been disputed. No one ever thinks that the tri-state tornado is anything but an F5. So it's always had an F5 rating. After a week or so of the recovery process of bodies, after finishing up the complete search and rescue process in the larger and smaller communities, the start of a weeks and months and years long process of rebuilding would eventually begin. Between the US troops, the American Red Cross, volunteers from other towns, and the citizens of the towns themselves, there were a lot of hands and people that really came together in these small and large communities to help get people back on their feet. One of the biggest challenges faced 
by far for any of the communities was Murfreesboro. And that is because of the sheer amount of people who were not only homeless, but now living in tents and boxcars in the middle of the city with nowhere else to go. This homelessness issue in Murfreesboro was one of the most prevalent long-term issues from the entire event. But despite how tragic and seemingly desolate the situation was, there was still a lot of positivity and hope and aid coming from across the country. In fact, financial aid was pouring in from the rest of the country. Slowly as months went by and aid was distributed across all of the impacted communities, people slowly but surely began to get back on their feet, rebuild their homes, their farms, and their lives. Which, by the way, of course, goes without saying, was incredibly difficult. We're talking about a lot of communities that were small enough that the single commodity or business that really helped the town thrive was completely destroyed. Oftentimes, companies in these areas would choose to outsource their work or business to a different town rather than to rebuild what had been lost in the original town. Not only putting dozens or hundreds of people out of work and families now without a source of income, but it also put entire communities on the brink of falling apart. There were a few companies who did work hard to try to rebuild the business in the original town. One company called the Brown Shoe Company did open a second plant, which employed 400 men in Murfreesboro to help get them back on their feet. Another option that a lot of towns chose to do was to exchange food and sometimes clothes for those who were willing to work with their hands and help with the rebuilding process so they would exchange goods for labor and at the very least that allowed people to have a meal at the end of the day. So for some of the larger cities like DeSoto and Murfreesboro specifically, the recovery was a little bit quicker in terms of rebuilding physical locations simply because there were so many more people available and there was a lot of financial aid available as well. Now, sadly for a lot of these smaller rural communities like Parrish, Illinois, they would just never rebuild. Parrish, as we discussed, the town of 250 lost almost 30% of its population and all but three buildings. This is one of the towns that was never able to recover from the Tri-State Tornado's deadly blow and unfortunately became one of the several ghost towns from this era. For Murfreesboro specifically, the twister caused a depression for almost 20 years before it was able to be economically prosperous again. And sadly, despite even some of the more positive stories of recovery after the tri-state tornado in 1925, the economic situation wasn't about to get better for anybody. We have to remember it's 1925 and the United States is just a few short years away from the worst economic downturn in our country's history. I know that this isn't the happiest story of rebuilding. It's not a Joplin story of rebuilding or coming back better than ever. It's a tragic one, but honestly, that is the reality of the tri-state tornado. Not many people really got a good ending out of this at all. Let's talk about the implications of the tri-state tornado long term. After the tri-state tornado, meteorology didn't immediately change. Ultimately, no matter how destructive this event was, the fact of the matter is that technological advancements in forecasting were still several years and decades away. Gradually, meteorologists would eventually begin issuing forecasts for severe thunderstorms. And while they weren't able to tell the specifics of how severe and where the storms might happen, this was a major advancement for forecasting and meteorology. A few short years later in 1948, the next major milestone in tornado forecasting would happen when a twister struck Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. Because the tornado was damaging to several planes and structures in the area, two meteorologists were then tasked with trying to predict the likelihood of a tornado possibly striking the Air Force Base again, which they actually successfully did 
only a week later when a second tornado struck the Tinker Air Force Base again. Only this time, thanks to meteorologist Captain Robert Miller and Major Ernest Fawbush, the tornado forecast had already been created and the Air Force Base was able to protect its planes and personnel. They had just successfully created the very first ever tornado forecast. Thanks to their hard work and success, by the year 1950, the ban on the word tornado had been lifted and tornado forecasting was officially going to be in practice. As we conclude the story of the Tri-State Tornado, after examining what led to its freak occurrence and taking a look at all the death and devastation that it caused, there's really no ultimate takeaway here. Normally in my videos I like to have some sort of lesson learned or some kind of thing we can take away and reflect on at the end, but there's really nothing like that today. The Tri-State Tornado simply was and remains the worst tornado in American history in so many different ways. If there's one lingering thought I have after everything we've talked about today, it's a question of whether or not the Tri-State Tornado truly was a freak event, or is it something that can happen again? Anyways, that's all I have for today's video. I want to say a big thank you to all of you just for being here. An extra thank you to all of the channel members who have recently joined and just a really big note of appreciation for all of you who have been so supportive over the last month and in this change. And I'm just so grateful to have a little community that's supportive and always cheering me on and I'm just so really grateful for that. If you liked today's video, I'd ask that you leave a like down below and if you haven't subscribed, do that for me. And yeah, again, if you want to check out my Twitter and Instagram, I'll have those linked below for you. If you want to become a channel member, go on the desktop, you can hit the join button. There's three different tiers. So yeah, that's all I have. Thank you all so, so much for being here today. And yeah, that's all I have. I will see you all in the next one. Bye.